Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, once again for the opportunity for us as a family to come back to your word, to come back to look into the life of Jesus Christ and to find in him a beauty and a picture that gives not only life meaning, but gives hope, courage, and confidence. And most importantly, Lord, love that we do not possess. I pray, Lord, that as we look to your word, that you would speak to us, that in it we may see the Lord Jesus in the glory, beauty, and humility of his character, and that it may touch us and change us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Today's um, study or message is um, would be the mind and faith of Christ. The mind and faith of Christ. We'll first start by going to Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do weak as it was through the flesh God did sending his own son in the likeness of of sinful flesh as an offering for sin he condemned sin in the flesh so it says it started off by saying therefore therefore there is no condemnation to those are in for those to those who are in Christ Jesus now the interesting thing about this is why is it that if we are in Christ Jesus, if, if it's the scripture says that if we're in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. That would also mean that if we're not in Christ Jesus, we are condemned. Now, why is that? And what is the power that actually um, removes this condemnation? It says the law of the spirit of life. In Psalms chapter 40, it says, um, Lo, I come in the volume of the book is written of me. I delight to do thy will. Thy law is within my heart. When we're reading from Romans 8, it's uh, the book of Romans was written by a man by the name of Paul. Paul, his name actually originally was Saul, but when he became Paul, I, the word Paul actually means small. Now, the man um, before did a lot of terrible things. He killed, uh, he killed many Christians and persecuted them everywhere. But when the Lord got a hold of his life, he changed his name to Paul, which means small. And one of the things that brought about the conversion was that the Lord Jesus actually showed him his glory. And now when we're looking at Romans, and Rome is actually the last place that Paul um, went to and actually died there. We see this uh, this letter that he's writing to the Romans before he's there, and he's depicting uh, not just the Romans but believers in Rome, Romans in that regard, and he's depicting the struggle and the gospel that that I would say is not very much uh, seen or understood. Um, most of the times when we think about the gospel. We think about Jesus on the cross dying for our sins. We think of <clears throat> that because of the wrongs that we did, that God um, punished Jesus. And that is true. But there is much more to the story. And there needs to be a lot more to the story. And the reason why is if God had Jesus die for you and my sin, sins alone, that means that God had Jesus died 
for the wrongs that we would commit, which are as branches or the fruit, and he hasn't taken care of the root. And Paul in Romans, and it's echoed in all of his writings, wants people to know the root of the problem and the root of the gospel. He's, it says here, Paul says that, because of the law that is in Christ Jesus, he says the law of the spirit of life that is in Christ Jesus is what sets us free from the law of sin and death. Now the question is, why is it that we need to be set from the law of sin and death? I'm happy you asked that question. We go to Romans chapter 5. We find that it says, as through one man, this is Romans chapter 5, um, <clears throat> uh, verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And death spread to all men, because all sinned. Now, the point that's being made here is that when the father of the human race, Adam, had committed a sin, the consequences of that affected all of his children. It is not to say that all of his children um, are guilty of the same thing that he did but it came with certain consequences. Um, I used to uh, used to work in a clinic, and um, many a times when they go through um, the physician goes through um, seeing patients, one of the things that is many times said and presented is that the reason why people have to um, um, go on medications and do these different things is because of um, inherited, meaning passed down um, diseases that came from their parents. But the more accurate uh, way to depict it is not that diseases are actually passed down to, um, to children per se, but weaknesses can be passed down. But Praise the Lord that though a weakness can be passed down, God has also made a way for a strength to resist, um, to, to hold up our weaknesses. And this is what the gospel is about. That through Adam, every human being acquired a weakness. Every human being um, received um, uh, a deficiency as you would say, or a loss of power. And God knew that if he only, God and Christ knew that if they only had made a plan that takes care of the consequences of that weakness in us, that in no wise secures us to be strong in the future. What do I mean by that? If if I, as a child, am, when I was younger, um, if I was found to be a liar and my dad found out that I was a liar and he went around and apologized to everyone or paid for everyone, paid back everyone or clarified everything that I had ever done to anyone for being a liar, does that keep me or stop me from continuing to be a liar? Or if I am a burglar, I like to break into people's houses and steal their goods. If my father finds out and he goes and he pays everyone back for everything that's stolen, the only thing that my father has done is that he has he is he is excusing or covering for all the evils that I do. Unfortunately, not directly. I think that this is very much the gospel that's being presented. We talk about that God is, God is, um, God, when we, when we say the word, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But with God giving his son, he gave us more than just someone to cover for the wrongs that we've done. In Romans 
chapter 8 of what we read, it says, the law of the spirit of life. Now, why is this important? Many a times when we see the phrase righteousness, um, um, it is presented in the context of doing what's right, an aspect of character um, or a, a recognition of something that someone does. They do the right thing. But one thing that needs to be understood that God's law does not only require someone to do the right thing, but to also have the right moral character. The problem is that when Adam ate of the fruit, there is a power that comes in, causes a weakness that gives us a weakened moral character. This is why um, Paul says of, his, of himself, he says that his righteousness as, as filthy rags, even the scriptures talk about this, meaning that his character to do good outside of the action that he's done in himself, he realizes that he's weak. He cannot do this. And so the plan to save you and me and to give us a hope better than just a covering of our excuses is that God put in UMI's nature and came in to UMI's nature when the Son of God took on our humanity. And this comes back to our message, which is called the mind and faith of Christ. In Revelations 14, it talks about, it gives, it gives, it says, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Gospel is good news. And the first one says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who, uh, reading it for what it says, and worship him and worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, why is it important for us to worship someone who's done these things? Well, it's presenting God as the creator. Why is that important? It's presenting us to adore someone who is able to bring out of nothing something brand new. This is the first presentation of the three angels in the overall picture of the gospel. It says, fear God and give glory to him. Why should we give glory to him? For the hour of his judgment has come. The question is, what is this hour? What is this about? But that's, that's another topic. And then it talks about him as a creator, someone who is able to bring into existence things that were never there before. The next angels, the next, the next message says Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's distinguishing a place or a city that is in a fallen state. Similar to what we said before, that because of what Adam did, every one of us has inherited a certain weakness. But in this, in Revelations 14, we hear of a place or a city where God defines them as fallen from the state that they need to be. And then the, 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 the third angel's message starts off kind of scary, but it comes to this place where it says, here is the patience, or another way to say that, here is the perseverance of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, the, 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 the message we're looking at is the mind and faith of Jesus. Um, when we were started in Romans chapter 8, Paul brought out the fact that there is a law that was in and is in Christ Jesus. And because of what is in Christ Jesus, it breaks the power of another law called the law of sin. This is why Paul says in Ephesians, not Ephesians, Philippians, and this is coming back to our title, our message. He says, let this mind, this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, why do we want the mind of Christ to be in us? And then Paul goes into this whole picture about the character of this mind. It says, Who was in the very form equal with God? So the mind that is in us 
is one who was at the who is and was at the highest position in all realms, someone who was equal to God. But then it tells you more of the character of this mind, this person who had this mind. It says that he stepped down from that and took on a lower position. He became a servant and he was, he stayed a servant and submitted to God who he was equal to in this lower status, even to the point of dying. And because he did that, it says that God has exalted him above every name. But God exalting him above every name has more to do with you and me than it has to do with him. Because in Philippians 2, we already knew that this person that God is now exalting was someone that was already before equal with God. So how could God exalting this person be significant to you and me? And why is Paul telling us to have this mind in us? Coming back to the beginning where we talked about, Romans chapter 5 makes the point that when Adam sinned, when Adam broke God's law, it says that sin entered the world. And this sin that entered the world, Paul explains to be called the law of sin. In Romans 7, he says that this law that is called the law of sin wars against the law of my mind. This law wars against the law of all of our minds. Now, what is the law of our mind that Paul brings up? That is you and my moral nature, our ability to see what's right and to do what's right. That's why Paul says, I, I know what to do, but I don't do it. The reason why is because the law of sin that is in every human being, and we all inherit this as a passed down um, uh an inherited gift, terrible gift from Adam that we all get. However, as soon as the fall happened, the provision was made. And when Adam and Eve accepted at the beginning this prophecy about someone who would crush the head and create in a, a, a person called a woman, Eve thought it was her, it was referring to her, but it says, I will put in this woman and in the seed, the child will come from this woman, a hatred that a hatred that that child will have and whoever shares in that child's nature, a natural hatred against this uh, power of sin and Satan. So the gospel is presented of a child that will come from this woman who would have in them a hatred. This is speaking of Christ. And this is what Paul is talking about, that he wants you and me to have this mind in us because with this mind in us, it brings to us a hatred towards Satan and sin. Whereas before, without, without that power moving upon us and in us, we are naturally inclined to to do and to obey everything that Satan presents. This is why we see Jesus speaking to the Pharisees who kept on rejecting Christ, kept on rejecting Christ. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And so when Adam made his choice, he passed down to all of his children a, a weakness. And that weakness was the power of sin, which is referred to as the law of sin. You see that it's presented and alluded to by God's conversation with Cain. God tells Cain, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what's right, sin lies at the door and a desire is for you. The law of sin will seek to control men. As long as we do not yield ourselves to God, this power will always rule us. And it's through that power that Satan rules men. But the title of this message and the gospel presents that there was a mind and a person who chose to come into our nature, that there may be found in our nature a power that would resist the power of sin. And that power is in Christ Jesus. And this is why Paul says, let this mind be in you. Because if we do not let this mind be in us, we have no capability to resist the desires 
of our of our inclination, our natural inclinations, which lead us to evil places, and we have no power to resist Satan. But Jesus and the gospel presents that there will be a people in this time that will keep God's law, meaning they will have in their hearts a divine love that naturally does not in, uh, exist in them. And they will have the faith and confidence that was seen in Jesus because Jesus came into our hearts and he is going to do it again in a tremendous way in this time. So when we talk about the message for this time, prophecy presents that our world is coming to an event where the nation, the United States, is going to turn its back from the principles on which it stands. And interestingly enough, in the Bible, prophecy presents the United States as a lamb-like beast that will eventually speak as a dragon. This is strange. A lamb-like beast who will then speak like a dragon. Now, the lamb-like beast would be a reference to Christ. In John chapter 1, he's referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So here we have someone who is seeking to, to protect men, men's rights. That's who Christ is presented as. Interestingly enough, in the history of the United States, it was established under the concept that the, this nation was to built on the principle of everyone had rights, not just Americans, but on the principle that every man is born with inherent rights, inherent freedoms, and that and that it's God-given rights that no one can take from. In the Declaration of Independence, there's a section that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. This meant that everyone is born into this world to the right to life, the right to liberty, and the right to pursue happiness. It was a wonderful uh, disposition to have. However, when we look at our nation even today, we see that these rights are fundamentally being violated because of the same problem that, that, that we all inherit from Adam. It's not, it's not so much that our policies are wrong, it's the human heart. Paul makes this, this point very clearly. It is because in our heart, we have this weakness to selfishness that is created, that we have there due to the power of the law of sin. And if we don't yield ourselves to Christ and allow the mind of Christ to be in us, no matter what position or place we have, we will always seek to satisfy ourselves first and then we'll think about the interest of others. So in our in our in our in our in our perception of our moral nature, we cannot of ourselves keep the law of God. The law of God fundamentally says love for God first and then love for man. But when man fell, what became man's moral 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 compass in his heart unbeknownst to himself is number one is love for himself and then love for everyone else as they love self and so jesus and god the only way that they could find a way to save and help you and me was that jesus had to become a man because in jesus's nature possesses the actual living moral law in him. And for him to save the race, he had to put himself in our nature that you and me might have access to a mind that loves God and has faith in him. Without that, there is no possible way that we would enjoy or even want to be in heaven if we were exposed to it. Because the presence of God, of that world to come, would completely, absolutely expose our selfish nature. So as we're looking at the events and the times that we're living in, the reason why looking at the life of Christ is to sh get us to see what we are to seek for from the Lord. Not merely by our actions or our performances, 
but our prayers and by our repentance, us yielding ourselves to God and saying, Lord, do in us what we cannot do. Look at this. Look at the fact that when it says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Christ left his place and position that he rightfully had so that we might be able to return to a place we have no access or business standing in. But they're putting us, they have a security, Christ and Father. They are not only going to pardon our sins as the common gospel. Christ and Father want to put their love in you and my hearts. The, 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 the title of this message is The Mind and Faith of Jesus. And so when we look at Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, as it talks about a people that are going to stand against this lamb-like beast power. And they will have, they will keep the, the, the commandments of God, meaning his law, meaning having his love. And the faith of Jesus, meaning they will have his mind and they will have Jesus' confidence in God and his word in this time. And that's something that the Lord wants to give to you and me. Without it, heaven, Christ, the Christian life is a misery. We can only, we can only seek to measure our worth when we don't have Christ's love and, and heart in us. Our Christianity becomes that of measuring ourselves against other men. And whenever you notice that we cherish that thinking or that thought pattern, know that the law of sin and and the and the voice of Satan is 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 is, is has control. Being a Christian is more than a, a, accepting a doctrine or form of beliefs. Being a Christian is allowing Christ through the Holy Spirit to live in us. I think many times it, it fails in the Adventist church or uh, um, in the Adventist church that we don't lift up Christ and present him as the key to the Christian life. But I see in other churches that they use Christ's life as an excuse to live whatever life they have. God wants us all to come home. He wants to not, he's not only willing to, as I gave the picture of my father when I was a kid, he would not only want to go and pay all the debts of the crimes that I had done, he also would want to make sure that his son was no longer a criminal. Because if he brought his son home and his son's heart and mind had not changed, if that father had responsibility over a lot of many other people, it would be as though that father was putting his entire businesses in life and all those people that are under him under, at the mercy of a cruel son. And the Lord loves us too much to both put us in a place to take us home to a heaven that we would hate. Um, but the Lord also um, respects us too much that he would not force a salvation that we did not choose and accept for ourselves. Galatians, well, I'll close with about the faith of Jesus. In Galatians, it, it presents this when Paul is uh, presenting about uh, the faith of Jesus and what Jesus did. He says, um, he says here, the law, it says here, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. What does that mean? The law of God cannot look at you and me, seeing our morality say that we are innocent men and saying that this person should be allowed to go to heaven. It can't do that. It cannot. It does not only look at our works, it actually looks at what type of heart we have. And when it looks at that, knowing the root of the kind of heart we have, it says, no, everything is doing is a deception. He He's a criminal still at his core. But it says this. It says, a man is not justified or found innocent 
by the works of the law. So doing what the scriptures say to do as though we have the moral character. We just need to work it out. It says, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So putting our trust in Christ Jesus, that's how we are found innocent. That's how we are found acceptable. Why? Because when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, Christ dwells in our heart through our faith. And when the law looks at us, it not only sees the, it not only sees the heart of Christ in our hearts, which is that mindset of unselfish love. But when Christ is in the heart, he starts to bleed out in the way we act and treat people. It says, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we believe in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified, found innocent, found worthy by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, not by our own effort to be approved. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Why? Because every human being inherited that weakness from Adam. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we are found sinners, um, we ourselves have also been found sinners. Is Christ then a minister of sin? Does that mean that if Christ is in your heart, and this is the Christianity that's being presented, this is the gospel that's being presented, a gospel that's presenting that Christ. Christ dying on the cross is to cover you to the life of whatever you want to live. No. Christ died and seeks to dwell in our hearts that we may not be workers of evil, but that the revelation of God in the flesh, in the man Christ Jesus, might be revealed in the lives of his people. May it never be, this is what Paul says, for if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove to be a transgressor. It says, for through the law, I die to the law. What does he mean by this? This is Galatians chapter 2, verse 19. What does he mean by that? It says, through the law, I die to the law. Christ took on our humanity that had in it the law of sin, lived out in our humanity, and then when he died, he broke the requirement that the law, the, the claims that the law of sin has on our nature. In his death, we died with him. But because the law of sin has no claims on him, when he came back, he came back and brought us back, having completely paid our penalty in our nature. And now given us a nature that is, is strong, to not only is not only strong as past the second death, but as power over um, the power of sin. So when Paul says, for through the law, I die to the law, the law, the wages of sin is death. When Christ died, I died, you died with him. Faith is accepting that to be true and asking the Lord, not only saying, Lord, I see that you have died for me, and since you were in you and you were in my nature, the same humanity that we all inherited from Adam. That's why they call Jesus the second Adam. Since you died, I know this is why they call Jesus not the second Adam, the son of man. It means that Jesus was a son of Adam. That means that Jesus was an inheritor of Adam's fallen nature. It says. I have been crucified, he says this, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, by faith in the Son of God. Some say by the faith of the Son of God, and some say in the faith of the Son of God. Both are absolutely correct because it was Jesus' faith that saved us. And it is our faith in Christ that causes us to be a part, a recipient of that salvation. I do not nullify the grace of God. What does that mean? Since Christ has done this for me, I put my faith in Christ. Or, and or, when he says, no, the grace of God. Since Father and Christ have done this for you and me, we now yield ourselves and seek 
to God to give us life that we may experience the victory that Christ exhibited in his life on this earth. It's a whole nother topic, but one thing that we must understand, when Jesus was on this earth and shared in you and my nature, he had to deal with temptation. So Christ being in you does not mean that you no longer have to deal with temptation. Christ being in your heart is divine love for God, a love for God and for man that we cannot muster or produce. And it and it and it's imparted to us by our faith, not our feelings. And so as we put faith in Christ, as he goes throughout the day and as we seek him to give of his mind, asking for the Holy Spirit to impart that to us, Christ will manifest his character in our lives and we will be partakers of his love. Let this mind, Paul says, and his faith be in you. For if we have this both, we have nothing to fear for this time. But if we don't, then the Holy Spirit says through the scriptures, it says, um, harden not your heart. It says, in the day when you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Because the Sabbath is not merely about resting from physical labor. It's about resting in the work and salvation that is in Christ Jesus. And it is mighty to manifest it in your life. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, once again for the opportunity and privilege to look at your word and to find that in this time, what Paul found in his life, that to have Christ's mind in him was to have a dependence upon God, to have Christ's faith in him, produce a love for God and for others that he did not have him in himself, to have Christ dwelling in him was to be able to stand against all trials, not because of what we are, but as Paul says, and as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Just as Father, when the Lord took on our humanity, he said, I can of myself do nothing. The Father that dwells in me does the works. Jesus, who was equal, Father, and is equal to you, became a man that we might return home as children. I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would impress these things upon our heart and warm us to the love that you've shown through Jesus. And Lord Jesus, the love that you are trying to show to us of the Father and yourself. Um, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would do for us and we would w yield ourselves to him that you might be revealed in our lives and may we know that we are your disciples by the love we have for you and each other. These things, Father, we commit to you. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Happy Sabbath.